All right. Let's get into the Word. Are you guys ready for the Word? Did you get something out of the sermon series so far? Suit Up Church? We're in the middle of a sermon series that's called Suit Up Church. Because in the days in which we live, they have not changed from 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 years ago, they were called, we live in evil days, <laughs> right? And so we still find ourselves in a lot of hardship and a lot of weird stuff going on. And so the Apostle Paul, he's writing in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 6, that wear the full armor of God, be ready and stand. You know, th those are very strong words, but they have to do with in the days in which we live, we got to be ready. We got to be prepared about anything and anyone. And so we talked for the first uh, three uh, sermons through the elements, for the through the first three elements. Do you remember what they are? Number one was truth. We got to live by truth, right? We cannot live by lies or by hiding things. We got to live by truth. It's the core element. And then the second one was righteousness. And it's not our self-righteousness. It is God's righteousness. And that is just like this plumb line. Everybody remembers that sermon for some reason. But it's like this straight offensive line because it doesn't bend. I have to say, this last week, we got a bad review on our Facebook page from a lady that just doesn't like me anymore. And it's, uh, she called the church office, and she was asking if pastor would do premarital counseling for her and her gay uh, uh, fiancé, or I don't know how you even call it. But they want to get married, and uh, if I would do their, their, their wedding and premarital counseling. And it was explained to her that I don't think pastor would, would do that. And so, clue, 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 and hung up right away and left us a really nice bad review on our Facebook page. But you know what? It's like, I can't bend the rules. I, even when the world says, <laughs> e e even when the world says it's okay, the righteousness of God, just like a plumb line, is offensive. It's like, I can't take this thing and encompass it for all multitudes of sins. And everybody wants exemption from, from their sin. But it's not. As the Word of God says, it's wrong. Then it is wrong. Then it is sin. When the Word says it's sin, sin is sin. And each and every, and there's not one sin greater than other sin. Every sin makes us not enter into the kingdom of God. We all need to come to, to the cross to repent. We all need to go in by the narrow door. And narrow it is. It is not wide. Sometimes we want to crank this open wider. But it is not. It is the narrow gate. And so it's this righteousness of God. It's not a self-righteousness. But it's this righteousness of God that we need. And the third element was what? Readiness. Readiness. We got to be ready. We can't slumber. We can't fall asleep. We got to be ready. Those three things, we call them, those are the, the character elements. So there's three tools. Um, today we start with faith. It's one of the tools that are added to it, but it starts with our character. It starts with the personality. When the Lord tells you to get ready, He doesn't tell you to pick up skills, to pick up tools he first says change your heart change your character work on yourself make take a deep look inside and make sure that you live by truth that you live by the righteousness that comes from me that you live a life of readiness that you live this way you know i was reminded on first samuel chapter 16 where we have this this story about where god uh, put, uh, he has rejected king saul already and now he wants to anoint another king and samuel the little guy who uh, who grew up to be old, but as a little guy, he had to learn and to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God. And he's and like, there was nothing special about Samuel, but God picked Samuel, this little guy, because of his heart, and he rejected the high priest back then, Eli, um, and, and his sons who were in the succession of being the next high priest. But he picked the guy with the good heart, and now in his old life, he was supposed to, to anoint um, another one uh, for kingship, and in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6, uh, it talks about it. And they came and he looked at, at Eliab. So he, he, is, he found the house of Jesse. Um, in the house of Jesse, he had eight sons. And in, in that house, um, so they're all parading his son in front of him. Maybe one of them is going to be the next king of Israel and God is going to anoint him. 
And then they came and he looked at Eliab and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. It's like, surely he is the guy. He's got everything for him. He's tall. He's strong. He's probably a bodybuilder or something. He's just handsome. You know, he's just got everything. He must have all the features for him that can make him a, a king. But then the Lord reminds, actually, uh, uh, Samuel on a fact that he experienced in his old childhood. He says, do not look on the outward appearance or on the height or of a statue because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that is so true. If you're sitting here today and you're younger, I want to encourage you. It's in those young years when the Lord is looking for hearts. He's, uh, uh, the scripture says the Spirit of God is hovering over the, all the world. And he's looking for those that fear the Lord, that will obey him. He's looking at the inward stuff. I received my calling when I was 11 years old. I had no friends. I had no tools. I had no skills. <laughs> I've got nothing. How often after that did I tell the Lord, like, you better would have picked somebody else? How many times did I say that to God? But he looks at the heart. And when the heart is right, when the character is right, when the personality is right, when he sees that, he puts his calling on you and everything else is, is added later on. The Lord trained King David. He's like, he's a shepherd boy, right? He has nothing. He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I got an extra son, but he's really on, he's um, you know, out on the farm and he's just uh, tending the sheep right now. So nobody even thought about him. But the Lord has seen his heart there as he's battling the lion and the bear, as he's protecting the sheep already uh, from, uh, from predators that come in. And the Lord sees that heart. And then he says, because of your little faithfulness, because you're not scared of running away from a bear and a lion, you know what? You are the perfect person to shepherd my flock. I, I'm going to graduate you from that, those sheep to a larger flock. You know, isn't that amazing? But the Lord looks at the heart. And when the Lord says to us, we got to get ready it is his starting point is with us. The starting point is with our heart. There's no, no way around. All right? So that's the message before the message. I have to apologize. So Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we're at the same uh, narrative here. This is where it talks in, in verse 10. Um, Apostle Paul, he encourages the church to stand firm in those days. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, and against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore. Like, we get the message. We got to stand. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, or like other translations say, the readiness of the gospel of peace. And now let's come. So we, we have talked about those character elements, but now comes the tools. Now there's tools added. So just imagine again in the narrative, Apostle Paul watches uh, that, that Roman guard, as he just put on the belt, he put on the breastplate, he hooked it in, he sat down, he or put a foot, foot up somewhere and just uh, roped up his, his sandals, strapped it to the feet and just ties it up. Into, it's like he's getting ready. The Holy Spirit is just showing him all these things. And now after he's done with the body wear, basically, now he's getting over there and he picks up his shield. And as he's picking up the shield, and Apostle Paul looks at that shield and the Holy Spirit reveals to him that's just like the faith. That's like faith. You've got to have this shield. It, it, it's this shield. It's like a shield of faith. And this is what it is about. In all circumstances, <laughs> take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Hallelujah. That's what we need, right? The shield that is able to extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Um, my first point that I want to make is when we look at the concept of faith, we have to keep in mind that there is a condition for faith. 
There is a condition for faith. You know, it's very easy for us to sometimes say, encourage one another, but just believe. Just have a little bit more faith, you know. Just have more faith. There is a condition for faith. We already talked about that, but let, let me just really ponder that point down. Um, by the, this sentence here, I hope I didn't exhaust you last week with the grammar and stuff. Was, was, was that okay? Um, was good? All right. There's a couple of other elements here in this verse as well that I just want to highlight. Uh, so bear with me. In verse uh, 16, when it says here, uh, in all circumstance, in the Greek, it actually, uh, the, the literal translation is, by doing all that, or it means by these things. So just imagine, the Apostle Paul says, put on the belt of truth, put on righteousness on you, put on readiness on you. And then he says, by doing those things, now pick up shield of faith, helmet of salvation. And, and like, why, why would he say that? By doing that, what we have here in the Greek is a conditional clause. It is a conditional clause, which basically means there is a condition that needs to be fulfilled before you can get to the other part. It's like somebody saying, um, op by opening the door, you let the person in. You can't let the person in without the condition having first been fulfilled by opening the door. There is something, there's a condition that needs to be fulfilled in order for us to have faith at all, to have the shield of faith. And when you look at that, it's like what we talked already about, truth, righteousness, and readiness is the condition. Let me ponder this point down as much as we can because this is so important. We can have all the faith that we want, that we think that we have. We can have all the faith. We can pick up a shield, but if we don't have a belt, if, if we, we can stand naked behind the shield, right? We, we, we talked about this the, the last week when, like, my, my, my colleague, he was, like, barefoot standing there. It was like, he was not ready, right? But we can be naked behind the shield, and it's like, it, in the end, is we're going to be ashamed. We're going to, when the guard is down, we, we, can be, we, are, we, are, we can be affected by anything that the enemy throws at us. There is a condition in order for faith to work in our life, and that condition needs to be met so that faith can work effectively in our life. And that condition is truth, righteousness, and readiness. Is we, we, we can skip over this so fast. I really want you to remember that when it comes to faith, when it comes to believing that God will come through, that God is going to change my finances, that God will turn his family situation around, that God is going to save that sibling of mine that I've been praying for. When it comes to faith, to the concept of faith, our faith that we have for circumstances, it will only work if we walk in truth, righteousness, and readiness. That's hard. That's, it's hard, but that is what it is. That is what it takes in order for faith to be effective in our life. Do we understand that? It's like, man, am I there yet? I don't know. Have you moved mountains yet? <laughs> I'm not talking just about physical mountains, but you know, very often we pray about things, but we see little movement. And if you ever wonder why is that, Maybe, I'm not saying it's always the cause, but maybe the cause is sometimes it's because we ask wrongly, but sometimes it is also the cause because the conditions are not met. Because there is untruthfulness in our heart. We're not true about something. Maybe we have a hidden sin in our life, and yet we are supposed to come up with faith for another circumstance. It doesn't work. Maybe we have bent every sort of rule of God. And then God stands there and is like, man, you have bent everything that I've told you. And now you expect me to jump in and to fix your situation. Or sometimes when we're not ready, we're just in this slumber wind, this fog. We're not even ready for anything to, to give an account for, for our salvation. It's the power of God until salvation, the gospel. We're not ready. And when we're not ready, how are, we, how are we supposed to come up with faith? It just doesn't work. The condition needs to be met for faith to work. If you want faith in your life to work, make sure those conditions are met. So maybe I don't know how you do that. Write those things next to it. Those three things lead and empower those other three things. 
And this is, those are the tools that we're picking up. Now, the second point that I want to make, uh, I just want to talk quickly about the, the sentence here that, that we have, what faith actually does. Okay, there is some, this is what faith actually does, but I have not copied that sentence out of my Bible. I have translated it straight from the Greek. Now, what happens then, the Greek sentence structure looks different. It, we talked about it last time. It just looks different. And you, it, sometimes it just doesn't make any sense. My uh, translation here, the ESV, reads it in this way. And also, because they cut the shield. With which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. It makes sense. It's grammatically correct. We have a proper English language, and that's how it was translated. But in the Greek, the sentence structure is different. There is elements here that are just really important. I just want to show you those things. Because in all reality, it reads like this. By which you will be able every error of evil burning to extinguish. That, that's, that's how it's, it's called transliteration. It's just transliterated. It doesn't make much sense. That's why you're trying to smooth out language, and you have different translations that arrange it in a different way. But what is important about this one, I just want to highlight here, where it says, will be able, it's, it's a future indicative tense. It's not, uh, it's not the subjunctive, basically a volitional thing. So the Apostle Paul doesn't talk, I hope that when you pick up the shield of faith, that maybe you, perhaps you will be able to do that. He puts it in the tense that displays reality, a fact. A fact and a reality. It's like, just imagine the Apostle Paul says, if you pick up the shield of faith, that's up to you, you will, de facto, you will be able to handle anything that the enemy throws at you. This is not a guesswork. This is not a maybe. If you have faith, it will work. If you have faith, it simply, de facto, it will work. That's good news, amen. <laughs> If we pick up the shield, it will work. If we have faith, it will work. And for what will it work? Every. <laughs> Just highlight that word. I love that. Everything. Everything. Just ponder for a moment. There is nothing. There is absolutely nothing that the enemy, that Satan, the enemy of your soul, the enemy of your life can throw your way. Absolutely nothing that faith cannot handle. Amen. Think about this. There is nothing, nothing in creation, not in heaven and earth and under the earth, nothing can be thrown at you that faith, it's a reality, it's a fact that is not able to handle. If you have only faith as small as a mustard seed, it's like it's that condition. If the conditions are met and we have this shield of faith and we pick this up and, man, we get to hide it's the one place where we get to hide. We got to hide behind our faith. It's like no matter enemy, no matter what you throw our way, no matter even if it's causing me to die, even if I need to lay down my life, no matter what it is, it is by this faith that you cannot throw enough at me that this shield cannot extinguish. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. This is good stuff. If we have this faith, and then it talks about what the enemy does. And this is a funny uh, constellation. It says, arrow of evil burning. Now, let me remind you, or uh, maybe say that for the first time to you, uh, when, when in the Greek, sometimes the concept, this is, we're talking about burning arrows. Just simple fact, burning arrows. But in the Greek, when the word is taken apart and another word is inserted in between, this in the middle receives the emphasis, and I always call this the bridge. Uh, it's the word burning arrows, in uh, reverse uh, arrows burning. They're pulled apart, and the evil is inserted in between, receives the emphasis. So the bad stuff, let's just call it the bad stuff. When the enemy throws at us, the bad stuff. Did he ever throw bad stuff your way? Oh, man. It seems like he has deep pockets with bad stuff, right? He's got a lot of bad stuff. And he sometimes really likes to throw it at our way. And that is, did you ever notice that the enemy never throws cupcakes at you? <laughs> it just doesn't. He throws the bad, the worst stuff at you. And he's really good. And he has like, man, he's a, a good, really good aim and everything. And it's, it's interesting when the Apostle Paul said he calls it arrows. He calls it arrows. He doesn't say the enemy comes like with a spear and he's just trying to stab you and you get, 
to like this ninja move. You just move. Hey, show me, show me this thing. This, this my, my shirt. Uh, in first service, somebody gave me the shirt. I just really liked that. And I don't think Denise Janzik, uh, actually her kids, and I, I've seen this online before, but it says, they call me pastor because hardcore devil stomping ninja is not an official job title. <laughs> I like that. It's very true. You know? I need to thank her again. I just think it's really cute. But sometimes, amen. It's my job title. Amen. I like it. I, I've got a cool job. But I don't just believe it is the pastor's job. It is each and every one of you because this applies for each and every one of us. Amen? We, our job is to stand firm and to come against all the schemes of the devil, everything that throws at you, everything he has, and he's got a lot of stuff. So every bad stuff he throws at you, and those are like arrows. They're not always the seen things. Those are the invisible things. You never know where they're coming from, right? Ricochets sometimes. Anybody who knows anything about shooting guns is like sometimes you can have bullets flying all over. It's dangerous stuff. The enemy, when he uses arrows, it basically implies those arrows come out of nowhere. You know, it's like sometimes the enemy just hits our life and it's just literally coming out of nowhere. We did not expect it. We could not see this coming out of the, all of a sudden. It's just there, sticking out, and it's hurting. And the funny thing is, when it says, the Apostle Paul, he says, burning. So it's not just the arrow that hits you and creates an owie, but they, it's burning. When I was a teenager, I used to play a, a video game where I, I was uh, the Roman army and you have to conquer other armies. And I love the flaming arrows. You can always pick between the no regular arrows. Uh, nobody sees them flying. And then the flaming arrows, they are seen. But when they hit on impact, they create longer damage and more damage. And just think about it. When the Apostle Paul writes this, he doesn't say just um, a, a little dart or, or just something. He calls them burning arrows. When the enemy throws something at us, when he shoots at us, first of all, it hits us off guard. It hits us by surprise. And sometimes those things, they don't just make an initial owie, but they keep on burning. It keeps on Man, this is like I've got to deal with this pain. It's starting burning up something inside of me. Uh, desperation kicks in. I don't know what to do anymore. How many times did we, uh, during the week did somebody come here to, to the sanctuary and just breaking down because of flaming darts of the enemy? And they keep on burning. Uh, it's not just an initial thing. All of a sudden, the initial thing leads to a court case. And then the person has to deal with a court case. And maybe he's going to lose the family over that or a job over that. It's like it's keeping burning. And it's burning up the life when the enemy hits us. And when he wants to consume our life, he wants to destroy us, right? And when he throws everything he has at us, and when he hits us, that's only when the pain starts. And then it keeps growing and it keeps burning. And he's, he, that's what he does. That's his job. That's his, what he's good in. And he's throwing this bad stuff at us. And all these things are reality. And I, in all these things that he throws at us, we have one thing that protects us from that, and that's our faith. It's the only thing in the armor of God. Yes, we have the breastplate, and that, that helps too, but even breastplates and, and helmets, they can have holes, right? They, they, they can have, like, it, it can penetrate through those. There is one thing that helps us so that the things of the devil, of the enemy, doesn't even get close to us. Did you ever allow anything from the enemy to get close to you? <laughs> Too many times, right? Like, where's faith? Oh, I forgot about that. It's like, yeah, we forgot the shield of faith, right? We need to have the conditions met, but then we have the shield of faith. And then we have the shield of faith so that that bad stuff cannot get close to us. Sometimes it just happens, but we have a choice if we allow it to come close to us. Sometimes somebody says something to us. And you can in that moment, it's like, no, Lord, I know you've got this. And you just hand it over to the Lord. Or you allow it to get close to you. And it's like, but he said that. 
And it's not nice. And you ponder and you allow it to get close to you. And the closer it gets to you, the more it starts burning and it consumes you. And then you have a sleepless night. <laughs> you know, it's like it's just getting to you. It's getting really close to you. But we have one thing in the armor of God that helps us to not allow those things to get close to us. And that is the shield of faith. It's good stuff here in the Greek sentence. Amen. And then let's talk for a, se- for a moment now about I don't know, the out of relationship, out of relation between reality and the concept of faith. And that's my third point. I call the third point just simply faith does it. <laughs> because faith does it. Faith can conquer it. We have, we have something in the armor of God that makes us able to extinguish every bad stuff the enemy throws at us. And that is our faith. But when you think for a moment, what is faith? Is it like a piece of reality that you can feel, handle, touch? It is something invisible, isn't it? But the stuff that the enemy throws at you, is that also invisible? No, it's sometimes very visible, right? It's, it, you deal with reality. You deal with uh, bankruptcy or, I don't know, maybe identity theft or something. It's like you always, the enemy always throws reality at you. And if you get lost in reality, then you will chase and try to fight everything off in reality. But God has given us something that is an invisible thing to fight the visible world. And doesn't that seem out of relation somehow? The enemy throws reality at us, reality, and all we have is an invisible something. Just think about that for a moment. Doesn't that seem a little bit off? But in the end, it's more effective. Hallelujah. In uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, um, just listen to this verse. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. It says, for everyone who has been born of God, that's all of us, right? Hit your neighbor and say, you have been born of God. That's you, man. The Bible talks about you. Everyone who has been born of God, and it says, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And now it says how we do this. And this is the victory. So basically, this is the way how you overcome the world. So this is the victory that has overcome the world. Colin, here he comes. Are you ready for it? This is the victory. He's going to be talking about it. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith. Our faith. In our faith, we can overcome the world. We can overcome every evil stuff, every bad stuff, every, I don't know, addiction, every sort of stuff that the enemy would ever throw our way. In faith, we can overcome. In faith, we are overcoming this. So, but when you think about it's the only thing that we got. It's like it, 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 it just busts my mind. It's like when the enemy hits us with everything he has in this world, sometimes he's called the principality of, of the air, of, of this world, of the present darkness. He has all of reality at his disposal to throw our way, right? And all we have is nothing physical. There's nothing physical. There's nothing materialistic. There's nothing... I, I wish you would give us a microphone or a, or a tissue box or something, something physical that we can hold in front of us. I mean, the shield, we're talking about something physical against something physical. But when he associates that with faith, it is not visible. It is invisible. We have only an invisible something to protect ourselves from every visible and very much real stuff that the enemy throws away. Now, that seems so much out of proportion, but yet it is so effective. It is so effective. In Hebrews chapter um, 11, it talks about it, what, what, what faith is, the essence of faith. Uh, in verse 1, you probably know it by heart. For now, faith is the assurance of things. Hope, we hope for these things. It is the assurance. We are sure. We are sure. But they have not come yet. But we are sure of the things 
that are hoped for and the conviction of the things not seen. We are convinced in our heart. We believe. We just believe. We have this faith. We, it's unseen. We, we don't see it yet. It's not reality yet. Reality looks really bad. But we have faith that reality is going to change. It's this invisible conviction. Did, did, did anybody ever tell you uh, faith is blind? It's like blind faith. It's like the saying, you know, there's blind faith. Let me tell you something. Faith in God is never blind. Because faith, our faith has an object. And that faith is God. God, we believe in God. How can that faith be blind? If I believe in, in a piece of paper, it might be blind faith. But our faith is rested on God. See, the world doesn't know that. Because the world, doesn't, it, the world denies God. The world doesn't believe in God. So for them, they see our faith is into nothing. But it's not true. We have God. We have a God who is all-powerful that nobody can take away. And our faith rests in a person and in Jesus Christ who has overcome the world. Every knee must bow at that name. We have our faith has an object and that is God and Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Not of fear, but of power. And that power is very real. And it can manifest itself in reality very much real. Amen? Amen. We have, amen, yes. We have that reality. It just reminds me on, on King David here. Second. Um, in King David, <laughs> listen to his life. J just a little pericope out of his life. In Psalm chapter 6, um, in Psalm 6, it, it almost sounds like he's whining and he has been king here already. And he, he starts out here, and let me start in verse 2, where he says, Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Did you ever ask God, how long? Like, O Lord, how long? How much longer? How much longer do I have to go through this suffering? Verse 6, then it says, I am weary with my Moaning, every night I flood my bed with tears. I drenched my couch with my weeping. Man, you got a lot of stuff going on if you can talk like this, right? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood. He's soaking his bed in tears because he's crying so much and so hard because of the bad reality all around him. It's just not looking good for him. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. It's like, he, you're in a bad spot, man. You need a psychiatrist or something. Like, you need something. But listen, he's not going to a counselor. Listen to what he's doing. In, in verse 8, he says, Depart from me, all the workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. That is faith. At this point, when he says his reality is he's surrounded by foes outside and inside. Everything does not look hunky-dory. It looks bad, actually. But he is crying. He's crying himself to bed every single night. He's in a devastated place. But he says, but he comes up with this faith and he says, the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly uh, troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. You know, he's like, he's coming up with, when it, like all reality looks bad for him, but he's his faith in the Lord, keeping his eyes on the Lord. And then check out verse 10, what he says. He says, my shield is with God. My shield is with, it's the shield of faith. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. In heart. God is a righteous judge. In another verse here in, in uh, chapter 28, uh, he says the same thing. Chapter 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. He is my shield. He, he the person, the invisible God, but yet very much reality. He is that shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. That is what faith is. You know, faith, let me tell you that, is not blind faith because we have God as our object. We trust a very real person with our faith. But even though our faith is invisible, faith will always materialize in reality. 
I want you to listen to this. Your faith is an invisible faith. But if you allow the Lord, if you trust God and allow the Lord to prove himself that he is God and that he is in charge, that there's nothing that he cannot handle. If you give him that chance to prove it without wavering, like, Lord, I trust you. I throw all of this stuff at you. No matter where my, my path has been, you know, crooked or something, like, I trust you with all my heart. And then it will materialize. It will become reality. Amen. Amen.